Welcome to the 200th episode of Road to Autonomy. I can't believe we're here. There is autonomous drones still driving cars and trucks. Wow, it's crazy. In the future, I think there's going to be autonomous planes. That'll be amazing. Well, cheers to the 100 more episodes of Road to the Autonomy. Aaron, Deer's a great company. How are they approaching autonomy? Grayson, that's a, a great question and uh, appreciate the sentiment around Deer being a great company. Really, our approach to autonomy and really technology as a whole is to make our customers essentially more profitable and productive in the windows they have to work, right? And so maybe let's break that down a little bit. Farming is absolutely a a 24 seven job, but these windows we speak of typically happen in the spring and the fall. And so that's like, if you think about springtime, it's going on right now. Customers are either preparing the soil or some applications are happening or essentially putting seed in the ground to, to grow a crop, right? Then on the flip side of that, as we think about fall, we're going to take that crop out of the ground. And so ultimately in either of these seasons, there's a heavy demand for equipment and employees, right? And so that's really our approach to autonomy is to enable customers within those peak seasons to really balance prioritization of tasks that are associated with either equipment or employees. And that's really kind of maximizing the output of the farm in those windows we think about. And giving customers the the tool or tools to essentially be the most productive in a short amount of time where they're presumably today managing equipment and people on the farm in cabs and autonomy kind of frees that person. It's special. I I would say for autonomy for farmers is special. You're enabling economic prosperity or enabling in some cases a farmer to keep the farm and the family to pass down for generations to generations. From a technology standpoint, so you have the different growing seasons, you have the harvest. Do you use the same tractor and then just replace the equipment on that tractor to enable that autonomy for the different seasons? Yeah, that's the beauty of of the tractor. It can do multiple jobs uh, on the farm. And so if you think about that base hardware component or the tractor itself, largely the machines that we enable autonomy on today will work spring, summer, fall throughout the cycles. And then the technology that really enables autonomy can stay on board of that vehicle. So really it is a change of just the implement, let's say behind the tractor to do a job autonomously, but the foundational piece of the tractor and the associated tech really don't change. When a farmer wants to deploy an autonomous tractor or various, let's call deer autonomous solutions on their farm. What are they, besides going to their deer dealer, what do they have to do from a practical farming standpoint? We're trying to make autonomy as a natural of a transition as possible. So as I talked, it starts really at that tractor that customers use today. And so that's the catalyst, if you will, for autonomy. And then as we think about the rest of that experience, so they have the autonomy, let's say hardware, which would be of course the tractor, camera system, the perception stack, if you will. Then really the experience starts in is in our cloud-based service that we have available to customers today where they're essentially pre-planning the autonomous job. And then as that vehicle is deployed to the field, just like they would do today, and the operator gets out of the cab, we're also giving them the mechanism to monitor the job, the autonomous job from afar through the mobile device. And so this is everything I've really described here may sound like new and interesting, but these are all tools that customers use today, whether it's the hardware or the technology that enables it. And so that's really how we're approaching this is making it as seamless as possible and to be as consistent as possible with what customers are already doing today. You, you've opened up the fun house. So the farmer sitting there, perhaps doing another task or making breakfast for their family, what type of data can they get? And then can that data help optimize the farm they can grow? I made corn the other night with a friend of mine from Indiana and and it was really good, fresh corn. Is there a way they can optimize the growing season or any of that data that they can use to overall optimize the farms? Customers use data in various ways to control costs, to understand how the, the agronomic components are additive to the farm or the decisions they've made. And all those tools are available to customers again today. And with autonomy, it doesn't necessarily change that. There's all of that data is still available to customers in, in the cloud-based service. We call it the operation center. 
but that's still available with autonomy. It doesn't necessarily change. And so those pieces are super important to make those decisions, really whether, whether you're in the cab or out of the cab and autonomy, we just give a little bit of freedom to, to make some of those decisions through the mobile device out of the cab. Uh, this could apply to what's called traditional deer tractors and both autonomous uh, tractors. Are, are the farmers able to get real-time weather data? Perhaps that there's a storm coming and the wind picks up and the tractor notifies the farmer if the tractor has to come in or they have to prepare the field for a potential storm? The weather is like uh, you go into any coffee shop in uh, rural America and weather is usually the topic of conversation. <laughs> Customers are definitely very aware of weather. Our native operations center, Ops Center Mobile, we call it, has weather data at customer fingertips. And so we know that customers like talking about weather. We know that our equipment is tasked, whether a human in the cab or fully autonomous, our equipment is tasked with doing a job. And so being aware of those weather conditions or those environmental conditions as they change are super important regardless. So we do give customers some tools to monitor that in real time from their mobile device, whether that's in a, again, an operator in the cab or autonomous. Absolutely, we wanna be able to make those real-time decisions. It ties into the overall theme of efficiency. You're really allowing the farmer to increase the efficiency of their farms. When a farmer takes possession of their autonomous deer tractor and they want to put it into operation, do they have to pre-map the farm, create an ODD? What does it look like from a technical perspective when the farmer physically has possession of that tractor? Grayson, good question. And again, it's going to be a scenario where this is really tools that are things that customers are doing today in a manually operated environment. And so we will, our customers will map boundaries and that's essentially the define the field area in which the autonomous vehicle essentially operates. So we call that essentially that practice is creating a digital fence and that is giving the vehicle a certain amount of constraints in which it can work. We obviously only want to do work where our customers intend to do work. And so the more pieces of information the customers can give us about the field, the better our system will perform. And that kind of goes into the ODD as well. It is when you give our machine as much information as you can, it can make better decisions in the field as you're essentially out of the cab. What type of perception system are on trackers? Is it a mix of LIDAR, camera, radar, or is there something else to enhance it because you are in a rugged environment? Today, to really unlock autonomy, of course, we have our guidance-based solutions. So using GPS guidance as part of this, but primarily what really enables an operator to step away from the cab is the camera system or the perception stack, if you will. That really, that was the ultimate unlock. We've been able to effectively navigate the field for decades. But when we start thinking about, okay, how do we make this system smarter and more aware of its surroundings? Obviously there's a safeguarding component is huge here. The cameras mounted around the tractor. And then of course the AI that really powers that is what really enabled us to go full operator out of cab, full autonomy in this case. So it's really a combination of sensors and equipment that we've had for decades with some new technology in the stack that Blue River has built for us. Lee and Jorge built Blue River is nothing short of fantastic. After your acquisition, it revolutionized precision tech. It changed the game. There's no other way to say it completely changed the game. Yeah, absolutely. The camera system that's on the tractor, can that help enhance the precision tech that you're running on the field as well? Can you get benefits out of that? Absolutely. If you think about that mapping experience that I described earlier, we know from a guidance perspective that there's an obstacle there. For example, something has been mapped, we've mapped around it, but the perception system really allows the cameras uh, essentially to then localize that indeed there is something there in that obstacle or in that boundary. And essentially that gives us the flexibility for both of these systems to interact together. One's telling us a certain piece of information. The other one is confirming that. And then succinctly, the machine navigates that said obstacle. It's kind of a thing of beauty when all those things come together. I keep going back to it. I'm probably going to go back to it 10 more times. Efficiency. Deers yeah. unlocking efficiency on farms. You mentioned AI. Was the AI technology developed in-house at Deer? Or did you use a third-party partner to develop that? How do you approach AI? With the acquisition of, of Blue River, that really unlocked a lot of this. We have had this capability in-house on various types of automation products throughout the course of time. But essentially, the system that you mentioned, Jorge, right, but that Blue River essentially built is really unlocked this. And that has been the critical unlock for autonomy. We've had various systems. I can look back on my career. I've been with Deer for about 16 years. 
I can remember seeing my first autonomous tractor like week one of starting. So we've been on this journey for a long time, but it really wasn't until that unlock of computer vision, if you will, that allowed us to essentially develop a level of trust for the machine to operate fully autonomous while safeguarding the vehicle, obviously bystanders, et cetera, that really unlocked that. Computer vision is only getting better. The depth sensing technology that Sony's pioneering is just getting exceptionally well. You can see it in the Sony family of DSLRs. It's wow. And then they have the big automotive division that's going to be in the Honda car. The depth sensing technology is getting real. Computer vision's getting real. You've been at Deer 16 years. That's impressive. I hope you have a deer hat for that one. I hope you got a hat. It's hard to believe. I got a hat and I haven't even been a deer. So I hope, <laughs> so I hope you got one as well. A few hats along the way. Hey? You mentioned that it started, the autonomy journey at deer started prior to your starting. Any insights into why deer decided decades ago to go on this autonomous journey? The fundamental problem that we're trying to really solve, and you've said it several times here, is efficiency. I think we had the foresight to realize probably two things. One, there's a pretty big customer problem in here and that farmers are essentially a very small portion of the overall population who are really tasked with feeding and clothing the, the world. And so we expect by like 2050, 10 billion people, and we have a finite amount of, of land to essentially produce a crop. And so there's this essentially a big problem in agriculture of finding the resources to be able to feed the world. That's probably the first thing. And then the other thing is, as we were continuing to build hardware and then our tech stack, we realized it's very achievable. And I think those are probably the two major unlocks. Being able to see a massive need for technology like this, and then of course, having the stack that essentially enables it. And so that, that's probably the two fundamental pieces that I would look towards in saying what set us on this trajectory. Since Deere has been with us for decades, in my opinion, we have an autonomy leaderboard and Deere is the clear number one developer and operator of, of off-road autonomy. There, there's no doubt about it. Any way you cut it, you are clearly the leader. Do you feel that your decades of experience in autonomy helped you become the leader in off-road autonomy? Yeah, I think it certainly helps. But the quicker you essentially recognize the customer problem and get these products in front of customers, obviously accelerated that as well. It's one thing to have all the cool widgets and the technology to do something, but until you really get that product in front of customers and really learn about what's important to them, how they expect this technology to actually help them be more profitable or more productive, kind of like what I said at the, the top of the show here, is that those are the important things and getting that product in front of the customer early and often really was the unlock here. How, it, it is the unlock. There's no doubt about it, it is the unlock. How are the autonomous tractors being used today for the different seasons? And then how do you see that changing in the future? Because obviously Deer is going to continue to innovate and introduce new autonomy products. Grayson, that's a good question. Today we're operating in, in tillage. So I kind of talked about this earlier on with the spring and the fall components. Tillage is essentially land preparation, prepping the soil for uh, a seed to go in the ground or after harvest is done to break down some of the organic material on the field surface. We really started with tillage for a couple of reasons. One is it's a job that is like always out prioritized. You're always going to want to get the planter running or take the crop out of the ground instead of doing tillage. And so that's probably one reason. The other is it's maybe a simpler task to do as well. And then again, of course, that's finding bodies and resources to actually do that job. Starting with tillage was fundamental for getting the technology, getting that core to allow for expansion. And, and what we've really said is like, hey, look, we know tillage is just the start. We're going to commercialize that. And then as we expand towards 2030, which is seemingly getting closer and closer every day, making the autonomous corn and soy production system. So that means jobs beyond land preparation that could be planting, that could obviously be application, that could be crop harvesting, that could be grain cart applications. And so you think about all of these jobs that our customers do throughout the year, really starting with that foundational piece of tillage kind of unlocks or opens the door for those additional jobs. It's fascinating. On the autonomy side for trucking, there's a driver shortage and it's having a negative impact on the economy. We saw what happened in the supply chain during the pandemic and we're seeing what's happened with inflation. You fast forward 7 billion people in the world. We need food. I call it yummy tummies. 
you want yummy tummies with fresh food. Deer's getting ahead of it and could have a positive impact to the U.S. economy and to the global economy, to potentially reduce inflation because you're investing in autonomy now to ensure that there is not a farmer shortage in the future. Applause for that. How many autonomous tractors are out in the wild today for deer? Today, we're operating with dozens of customers. These are paying customers. And now that might seem a little odd why I would throw that in there. But the reality is operating with paying customers has really unlocked what do customers truly need? And I think that's what's been able to really accelerate the development of autonomy specifically to deer is that started with customers early. And then we kind of, in getting the right customer, of course, but then also bringing the customer on the journey with us and essentially putting a little bit of skin in the game to really pressure test what we have to build, what we have to focus on, and then obviously getting that offering to those customers along the way. So those dozens of customers, it may not seem like a lot, but they have been absolutely instrumental in developing autonomy in helping us on this journey. That that has been key. It changes the game. You're going to get honest feedback. Paying customers vote with their wallet. They'll tell you point blank because they're spending money. It's, let's say, hypothetically, it's hypothetical, you have a non-paying customer. Oh, this is nice. I want to keep it going. Well, a paying customer is going to hold, your, hold you accountable to it because, as I said, they're going to vote with their wallet. From a business model perspective, how is Deer deploying these autonomous trackers? Are they leases? Are they subscriptions? Are they, you purchase it and then you pay for an autonomy subscription? What does that look like? Customers today can purchase autonomy enabling hardware on, let's say the tractor, for example. So whether you have an existing, we'll eventually have this solution as an existing, if you have an existing vehicle, so a retro solution, so to speak, as well as purchasing new equipment. So we're going to kind of focus on that one right now, but customers can order autonomy enabling hardware from our factories today on select models of tractors. So that's pretty exciting. Now, when we fully commercialize this next year, you'll need to, of course, purchase the perception system, complete the kit, and then the software will be a, a SaaS model. So a solutions as a service product where customers are only paying as they use. And we've gotten really good feedback again, going back to these paying customers on how does that type of business model work for their operation. And really what we found is that from an operation of any size, this tends to fit pretty nicely. So one example, we have a customer that has since retired from farming. We want just as much as he wants to stay connected to the land. He wants to continue to farm even though he's retired. And he's heavily reliant on part-time help in this phase of his career, life, et cetera. He's looking at autonomy as like, hey, look, I have a low upfront hardware costs, and I only have to pay as I need help. And this is a really an unlock for him to continue farming, essentially doing what he loves. And we see that also with farms of scale, where maybe they're the, the lead employer essentially in the area. So they don't have as maybe big of a labor problem, but they're all also looking at it like, okay, I can now be much more productive than I previously was by extending my day with the cost of technology and as I use it, rather than essentially trying to manage the logistics of operating 24 seven. So from farms of various scales, this has been pretty well received over time as we've walked that journey and got that spec for billing right with our customers. That's a game changer. I think about, and this is not really in, in your field, but we had a medical episode a while back. You're helping mental health. You could extend his life because he's happy. He's doing what he loves. There's a lot of societal benefits outside the economic benefits. You just unlock societal benefits from there. Do we get to a point in the future, no timeline on this, but in the future where a farmer can call in an autonomous deer tractor for the season and then they can go back to deer headquarters or to the next farm and use it that way in the future, perhaps it becomes a, a subscription service? We're just on the cusp of learning what are all the, what are all kind of the new businesses or the new types of opportunities that essentially pop up here, whether it's for deer or for our customers or for their dealers, et cetera. So I think we're still in the absolute early phases of that. But what those conversations tell me is that our customers are thinking about it is what else can they use this technology for so to, to prop up their business or what other things do do we see coming out of that? And so 
the future is obviously hard to predict, but we do realize that autonomy potentially has some unlocks beyond just making one customer essentially more profitable or more productive. There may be other opportunities on the farm for autonomous solutions as well. The opportunities are, are endless. And the only thing that's going to limit us is our imagination. Are there limitations on tractor size when you look at autonomy where, oh, it's too big, too small? Any size limitations on the tractors when you look to add autonomy to them? We've started with our 8R tractor. If you see any of the, the content out there, it's really centered around the 8R tractor. That machine is essentially the Swiss Army knife of agriculture, right? It can do a lot of things. And what we've been able to do is build the stack in the process, if you will, around that 8R tractor that, of course, really unlocks us to move up and down our product lines or our portfolio, if you will, of tractor sizes, essentially, or vehicles for that matter, to really unlock autonomy. So what we've learned on that 8R that we've had out in the public today really has opened the door. We can expand this up and down our product offering. When Deere's looking to automate a tractor in your product offering, what goes into that decision process? So the 8R is your, your Swiss Army knife, but then you have a tactical knife or you have a precision knife. What goes into that decision-making process? It starts at the very foundational level of what are the problems that autonomy can help our customers solve and where do we see those? So we first look at where are our customers struggling with or where are our customers challenged and where can this technology help? That's like the fundamental piece. Fortunately, we have a pretty deep portfolio to say, oh, that is the piece of equipment that best solves that problem. And then we go about understanding the constraints or some of the technical challenges of making that vehicle essentially autonomous. The short answer to your question is it really starts with the job or the problem. And then we look at the technical challenges of building an autonomous solution around that. Are there any geographical environmental concerns where autonomy from Deere's perspective is, is not ready yet. I know that you're looking exploring into Brazil. That was probably with the Starlink press release, but Deere's a global company. Are there any restrictions? Perhaps it's too windy, the altitude's too high. Are there any restrictions there when you look to deploy autonomous tractors? That's a great question. We're starting in corn and soybean production. We've been pretty vocal about that's really the ODD that we're starting in. And so you can think about the geographies traditionally in the Midwest where those machines operate. And really what we're doing is trying to understand, okay, how do we really nail that ODD or that geography, and then look for ways to expand our model cap capability beyond that core Midwest surface, essentially. Fortunately for us, customers do like to think to keep things as consistent as possible. So our system actually is pretty performant across many geographies. That's something that we've worked pretty hard for. But there will be these edge cases that do generate a certain amount of limitation as well. And so, again, we're going to stay dialed in on nailing the ODD in the Midwest and corn and soybean production. And then we'll continue to kind of go, OK, how performant is the model if we went here? Brazil, for example, you mentioned, but that global element, but then also regionally as well. The big thing is farming practices do change, right? A field in Iowa looks different than a field in Illinois and looks very different maybe from a field in Nebraska where there's pivot irrigation. Those are the things that we're really focused on is are these ODDs that we have to solve in corn and soy and then begin to expand beyond that. My wife's from Indiana. She's a Midwest gal. And I've been there visiting her parents. And boy, oh boy, that weather could change on a dime. All suddenly it's a beautiful one moment and it's hailing the next moment. Do you harden these autonomy tractors, the sensors, because the environments that you're, you're operating in, a corn can hit a sensor today that's not hardened and snap it or cause damage to it. Do you harden the sensors for the environments that you're operating in? Absolutely right. You can imagine we're operating in definitely tough conditions the majority of time, whether that's hot and cold cycles, obviously dust, dusty conditions, windy conditions, blowing debris, et cetera. And, and one thing that's really helped us here is, again, I'll mention this very specific ODD. What's different about what we're trying to do with autonomy is a job. So there is like an agronomic component here as well. Customers are not going to want to agronomically, let's say, run in some of these extreme conditions that you would maybe say like, well, yeah, we could build our vehicle to perform in snow, but that's pretty unlikely. So a little bit of egregious example but really honing that ODD around what are those, those fundamental expectations? What are we most commonly going to see on the farm? And not only 
make the machine productive, but also the job it's doing also acceptable for the customer. And, and, and typically what we find is our system is hardened enough that it's the customer is essentially saying, look, agronomically, I do not want to continue work beyond what this machine essentially is capable of doing today. So we've got like this really nice sweet spot of, hey, look, I don't expect you to run in these conditions. I don't want it to. And that's really helped us. You're taking account the realities of operating a farm. You have the heritage and the pedigree for that. You're taking that heritage and pedigree of deer and, and applying it to autonomy, which would create immense amount of benefits as the company scales your autonomous operations. What does the future of autonomy look like for deer? That's a great question. First and foremost, we're going to continue to enable existing and new equipment to have kind of the, the foundational hardware and software components to enable autonomy. We've been doing that for decades now. Our customers have been essentially preparing for autonomy for decades now, and we'll continue that journey of making sure that every piece of equipment that we can that's manufactured today will be compatible with the autonomous future, whatever that looks like. There's probably two things and I've referenced them previously, but like we got to nail tillage and we got to do that in a couple short months here as we approach 2025. And then the next phase of that is, okay, how can we take that stack that I mentioned we built on this 8R, on this tractor today, our, really our bread and butter flagship, Swiss Army knife, whatever you want to call it, a tractor of many talents, and cascade that across the corn and soy production system by 2030. And again, it's hindsight now, but as the calendar flipped to 2024, and I was thinking about, okay, a year left for... Uh, commercialized tillage in five, we'll call it five years to the end of the decade for the corn and soy production system. It got really real. I'll make a prediction. You'll hit your goals. You'll exceed your goals. You've, you've done it. You'll continue to do it. And I can't wait to see it because the, and I can't wait to see when you've trademarked the, the, the headline, nothing runs like an autonomous deer. When you come out in a marketing campaign or I see it in your CES booth one year, we'll know you've made it. Your investors will know you've made it. The farmers will know you've made it. The public will know you made it. And the AI tech community will know you make it. Aaron, this has been awesome. This has been a lot of fun. As we look to wrap up this conversation for today, what would you like our listeners and viewers to take away with them? Hey, Grayson, that a really good question. And something to think about a lot is like, how do we tell that story to the greater audience? And, and I think there's a couple of things. Farmers are some of the most innovative folks in the world, not just within autonomy. They're pounding on our door saying, hey, we need help here, but also the tech that's being used today. And so... I think that's something that's really unique to agriculture that's often overlooked. These folks are doing adopting technology today, but the, probably the most important thing is they're looking for technology to really pass on their legacy to future generations. You talk to a customer, usually one of the first things they'll tell you is what generation of farm their, their family's on. And that's something that is super important to our customers, but also to us. Like we want to enable that as well. And when we're both saying, hey, technology is kind of the, the next frontier to enable that and to enable the farm to continue, we want our customers to do that and we want to be part of that as well. And then there's this little thing that they literally put food on our plates and clothes on our backs. And so a huge, huge responsibility for these customers and essentially their successes are successes of humanity. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to give them the products that enable them to do all of those things, in this case, it comes from autonomy. Deer is building the tools that allows farmers to be innovators, early adopters, and most importantly, farms are businesses and the individuals that run those farms are business people. The future is bright, the future is autonomous, the future is deer. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Thanks, Grayson. Appreciate you having me and appreciate the time today. You're welcome. And let's not forget, there's nothing that runs like an autonomous deer.